Well, we are starting a new subject, thermodynamics. Now, uh, thermodynamics uh, sounds like temperature and uh, dynamics together, but uh, most of the time, we're, of, of course, we are dealing with temperature, but predominantly we're dealing with energy. So thermodynamics is mostly about energy. Uh, so the first thing we're going to look at is our energy sources. Where can we get energy from? And here's a list of places where energy can originate. Mechanical energy, which is motion energy. So if you drop something, you've given it kinetic energy. That's mechanical energy. If something, if a shaft is rotating, that has mechanical energy. And uh, thermal energy, which is energy due to heat. Electrical energy, obviously, uh, that's electrical power. And fluid power, which is another form of energy due to the fluid. So the fluid having pressure and velocity means it has energy. There are other ones as well, like chemical energy, solar energy, nuclear energy, even sound energy. So there's quite a few. Now, the interesting thing about all the different types of energy is we can measure them. When we measure energy, we measure in joules. Which is after a guy by the name of Joule who made up the idea. Uh, joules are the same regardless of what type of energy you're using. So you always measure anything energy is measured in joules. Doesn't matter if it's mechanical, electrical, thermal, fluid, chemical, nuclear, solar, etc., all in joules, which is really cool. So we give it the symbol J for joule, but often in engineering we're dealing with bigger than a joule, so we often work in kilojoules. In, uh, when, when we uh, then divide joules and we want to know the joules per second, how much energy per second, then a joule per second is a watt, which is named after James Watt, the steam engine guy. As a matter of fact, uh, he's the guy that invented the horsepower, and uh, we ended up using his name. Once we got rid of horsepower, we still had felt sorry for the guy, so we decided to call our replacement the kilowatt, which is a replacement for the horsepower. We decided to call it watts. <coughs> now, um, the, the second part about energy is that energy can be converted from one form to another. And we did that when we did dynamics because we could have the potential energy of something and then that gets converted into kinetic energy. But you can keep going. It then crashes into the floor and gets converted into thermal energy. It heats up. Or it might get converted into something else. And here's a bunch of different examples of the way energy could be converted one to another. So, uh, for example, a heat engine converts the energy in the petrol to motion, but it doesn't just go directly. You start off with the petrol, the petrol burns, so it's now converted into heat. That heat then converts into motion by pushing the pistons, so now we've gone from chemical to heat to mechanical power. So we've gone through those three. Other ones, for example, even just a simple uh, electric car, for example, you've got chemical energy, this time in the form of a battery, which then converts into electrical energy, which then transforms into mechanical energy through the electric motor. And th there's various forms of those. So uh, you can go through those at uh, any time. <coughs> now we're um, interested in some of the important words in thermodynamics. Um, so the first one, of course, is the word thermodynamics, and that means uh, that you're tracking something to do with temperature. But uh, we mean more than just temperature, we mean more along the line, lines of energy. So most of the subject is related to energy. In fact, all of the different symbols that we use, we've got work and heat, which is a Q, and we've got internal energy, which is a U, and then another one called enthalpy, which is a H. We're sort of working our way up towards there. All of these are all measured in joules or watts. So joules or kilojoules is our main unit. If you're not sure, if you see a new symbol, It'll be kilojoules in thermodynamics. <coughs> um, all right, so a bunch of words here. Let's just go through some of them. Um, when we're working with thermodynamic systems, we try to do a free body diagram, but it's not that simple. In free body diagrams, like in dynamics or in statics, we can just pick an object like the table and apply all the forces to the table. That's nice and easy. But in fluid mechanics, you remember, we had to... Uh, Treat, treat part of the pipe, so the fluid's running through a pipe, for example, and we cut off the ends of the pipe and treat all the forces acting on the pipe to get a force balance. It wasn't a, f a body because the, the fluid's always moving. We, what, in fluid mechanics, we con called this a control volume. <coughs> so 
Just checking it was on. We can talk, we call this a control volume, uh, which is the equivalent of a free body diagram, but for something that's always flowing. In thermodynamics, it gets even more complicated because you can have inputs to the motor, outputs, heat lo loss and heat gain and stuff. So, for example, you might have a turbine, and we just draw a dotted line around the turbine and say, OK, well, there's steam coming in, there's steam going out, there's heat going out, and uh, there's power due to the shaft coming out of the system. Now, instead of trying to draw the you know, nice little turbine, which is too much work, I just draw myself a box and say, OK, this is, this is heat in, oh, sorry, this is my steam in, which has some energy. I'll just write steam. And steam coming out, which has got less energy, hopefully. And we're losing some heat. Q is the symbol for heat. And we've got some work coming out here. So that's the idea in thermodynamics of a free body diagram. But we call it just a system. And we typically just draw ourselves a box and write what's going in, what's coming out. And we calculate that. So that's why we use the word system. It's an equivalent to free body diagram, but now we're working in a bit more complicated sort of systems. So everything inside is the system. Everything outside is just called the surroundings. So we're looking at what's happening between the inside and the outside. I don't care about what's happening between the bearings and the housing and all the you know, compressor blades and turbine blades and all that. I don't care about the details. I only care about what crosses the boundary. What's crossing the boundaries? It's exactly the same as free body diagram. Remember, we, if we're doing a free body diagram of the whole truss, we don't care about the forces inside the truss when we're doing the whole truss. We only care about what crosses the boundary. So it's the same principle. All right, we have uh, some other definitions, a closed system and open system. Now, a closed system is where, uh, like, for example, the air in this pump. I've got air in there. If I block that off, right now I have a closed system. So as I compress it, I'm squashing the air and I let it go. I'm opening the air again. So that's a closed system. I have one piece of air and I'm working with that contained fluid. An open system would be like this one, where the steam comes in and goes out. So if there's a flow through of material, that's an open system. If it's closed in and can't escape, that's a closed system. Pretty simple. The uh, third type is an isolated system where you don't even allow heat to go in and out, which is when you're insulated. So a closed system that's insulated would be an isolated system. All right. Um, just whizzing down uh, towards the bottom here. We've got some special words too, which we're going to need to use along the way. Um, and they all use, well, a lot of them use this little phrase, ISO. ISO doesn't stand for International Standards Organization. This is a little bit of Latin word there. ISO means same. Same. So uh, ISO thermal, what do you think that would mean? Uh, same what? Same temperature. Thermal stands for temperature. Same temperature. So if, a cyst if something's happening and it's staying at the same temperature, that's an isothermal process. Now this bicycle pump, when I squash it up, I c my, my fingers actually heats up quite quickly. By the time I get to about four strokes, I've got to take my finger off because it's burning. So would this be isothermal, do you think? Is this an isothermal process? My finger's getting hotter? It's not isothermal, is it? The temperature's changing. Can't be isothermal. So that's not one of them. All right, the next one I'll do is isobaric. Isobaric. Baric is to do with pressure. Just remember the word barometer. Barra standing for pressure, air pressure. So isobaric would be a constant pressure process. Constant pressure. Is this constant pressure? Starts off at atmospheric pressure, and then I compress in there to about 100 psi or much more than atmospheric pressure, about 10 times atmospheric pressure. Squashing it down at about a tenth the size, about 10 times the pressure. Constant pressure? No. How can I do constant pressure with this? This is a constant pressure process. Oh, didn't go up. If it went up, it would be. So constant pressure would be that it has a constant force on it all the time. And if I then heated it up, then it would rise. That would be constant pressure. ISO Coric. You might have to guess on this one. It stands for constant volume. And they're the, big, they're the big three important ones. Temperature, pressure, and volume are the three important words, especially when we come to gases uh, later on. 
uh, which we'll be using. Now, um, there is another one out of these which is called adiabatic. And that is a fancy word for insulated. Just means insulated. Adiabatic specifically means no transfer of temperature, no transfer of heat, I should say. <coughs> All right, so that's, um, that's it. Finished. So I'm going to whiz through the quiz because that's way too easy for a lecture and we're over it too quickly. So let's just run through some of these questions here and see if we can um, go a bit further. <coughs> Most energy attained. Now some of this will be reading out of your textbook. There's a chapter there, the first chapter in the thermo textbook talks about a bunch of this stuff so which we haven't gone through in this lecture. There's no, no need to repeat it on the web page. So you will need to go through some of that on the... Uh, in the textbook, most of the energy that can be attained from biomass, la -di -da, da da If you Google it, you may have slightly different numbers, so just check with the textbook. Um, we'd be talking like uh, around 80%, I think, for um, fossil fuels. But that's asking where it came from, not how much of it is. Okay, okay. Most of the energy that can be obtained from biomass, wind, solar, fossil fuels originally came from. Sorry, I misread the question. Where did it originally come from? Up there. Right, so what causes wind? What's what creates wind? The rotation of the Earth. Partly, partly, but something more specifically. It's the temperature change. So wh while the Earth's spinning, that air's gone cold, and then it comes around to the sun, it begins to heat up, and when it does heat up, it expands and creates wind. Um, I was doing a time lapse uh, one morning at Hawkesbury Lookout, and we're looking down on the, f it had fog all over the plains, and as soon as the sun rose, you could see the fog suddenly starts moving really quickly. Before that, it was just sort of moving, drifting along. And as soon as the sun rose, it started moving around like waves. It's quite amazing. So the sun's heating of the air creates the, most of the wind. Um, and then fossil fuels, you'd, you'd say, well, a lot of that's uh, originated from plants, and the plant's photosynthesis is coming from the sun. If you... Sun and temperature changes are the main ones. Yeah. I'm so... Yes, when we're talking about household appliances, which one uses the most energy? Heating is a, is a big energy user, particularly trying to heat water, which is hard to heat, and heating air because there's a lot, lot of it. So anything that heats air or heats water will be using most of your electricity. Um, why is propane used instead of natural gas? Now, natural gas is a mixture of gases, um, all the way from methane, which is the lightest gas. In fact, it's lighter than air. You can make a balloon out of it. Uh, methane, ethane, propane is is three carbons. Butane four, pentane five. No, no, other way, lower. So it's hard to, if you compress natural gas because it's got some of the really light gases in there, it's hard to compress them. They re they keep refusing to turn into a liquid. But if you get bigger ones. By the time you get up to four, like butane, it's very easy to liquefy butane, and that's why they can use it in the cigarette lighters, just a little plastic pressure tank made of plastic. It's only a low pressure to, to liquefy butane, so that's a low pressure tank then. So propane is about in between, so it's uh, suitable for a steel tank. <coughs> so natural gas takes more pressure to liquefy than propane. It's cheaper, though. Yes, because your pressure tank is going to have to have higher pressure. So it's not because propane is easier to smell if it gets a leak? No, that's, that, you could do that to any gas. You can put, because what they actually do is they put a, a um, they put their scent into it. That garlic sort of smell, that's deliberate. I deliberately put this uh, chemical uh, which makes sort of a garlic smell. They put that, they can put that into anything. Oh, I, I, no, it's got some fancy name. It's a really smelly substance. It smells kind of like garlic, that gas smell. Well, gas is in, it has no scent, which is dangerous. Yeah. So they put that scent into it so you can smell. Oh, I can smell gas. In mm, yeah, yeah. In a, in a coal mine, it doesn't have the garlic smell in it. It's odorless yeah. and very dangerous. So methanes and propanes and all them, they have no smell. All right, then there's a couple of questions here about carbon footprint stuff. And the main thing we're doing here is we're doing some calculations based on what's CO2 versus what's carbon. So in some places you might have to do a calculation based on the um, weight of the molecule. Um, but here, which gas is considered to be the main contri contributor to global warming? Well, we've heard enough about it over the last few years. So 
So they're talking about carbon dioxide. Um, yeah, well, carbon monoxide um, quickly disintegrates, well, quickly, um, what's the word, reacts with oxygen to get carbon dioxide. So carbon monoxide is unstable, it wants more oxygen. If there's a lack of oxygen, you'll make carbon monoxide, because there's not enough oxygen. But once, they have, once it finds enough oxygen, it'll revert to carbon dioxide, naturally. So it's not really dangerous in the long term, it's only dangerous in, if it's in an um, enclosed area. Approximately what percentage of the energy in burning coal reaches the consumer as electricity? So this question is actually uh, referring specifically to the um, <coughs> typical coal-fired coal power station. And uh, in the power station, you'll notice that there's, it's a multi-step process. First, we've got to go from coal, which is this one here. Not even 40%, because the turbine itself is only 40 to 50%. And then you've got all the other losses. So turning coal into uh, heat is around 90%. And then turning that heat, at which gets the heat into the steam, it's around 90%. And then getting that steam into t rotation, which is the turbine itself, is only about 45%. So we're down uh, the low 40s now. And then we've got to turn that into electricity. Now the generator's pretty good, way up in the n high 90s. So we don't lose much there. Electricity machines are pretty good. So but we haven't finished yet. We've got the electricity at the power station. We still have to get that to people's places. And that is a fair loss there because we ha might have to travel long distances. So that can, can lose a good 30% or so. So by the time you're there, you're only sitting around 30%. How much? Around 30. Oh, yeah. Yep. By the time you take all the losses into account. <coughs> and also there's, uh, there's power to drive the whole power station as well. It's all right to take each one of those, but there's power needed to run the whole machine, the whole system. Right. Yeah, they do, but that's you taking a percentage out, yeah. particularly uh, pumping the water into the back into the system at high pressure. And, but the biggest loss of all is that the the steam has to come out of the turbine hot. That's why there's a big loss. So it's coming in really hot. It's red hot pipes of steam coming into the turbine, and then going out of the turbine. It's not allowed to get too cold because then it starts to turn back into water. And if it does that, it'll hit the blades and erode them very quickly. So they have to still be quite hot when it comes out. That's why we have a loss. What temperature is the steam in the curve? Is that 500? Coming in? Yeah. Yep. And what is it when it comes out? Like? I don't have the numbers no. handy, but we can look that up. It's a good question. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, in the low, low 30s, maybe even 20s. Which of the following is not a fossil fuel? Well, you can uh, work that out. We've got 29 litres of petrol, how much carbon dioxide is produced if you burn 29 litres. We've got some numbers down here, so you just find your way through here. Um, carbon dioxide here emitted per litre, uh, per kilogram here. So we've got 2.3 kilograms um, of carbon dioxide for every one litre of petrol. Yep, and just, just watch though because it says here in litres, not in kilograms, so we need to know the density of petrol. And it's quite light, it's only... Uh, I got the correct answer by just assuming litres equals kilograms, and I still got it right. Did you? Yeah. Oh, that's, that should be kil kilograms then. Because uh, we, we need to convert that. Well, I better, ch I better fix that. I got the right answer by Did just you? changing litres to kilograms. <laughs> uh, what mass of carbon is produced? So the difference between that question and the previous one is carbon dioxide versus carbon. Carbon dioxide... Is, uh, is a molecule, one carbon, which is 12, two oxygens, 14 each, and so it, it ends up no, weighing... Oxygen is 16. 16. So it ends up weighing... Uh, yeah, sorry. Nitrogen is 14. 32, so it's 44 grams for a mole of carbon dioxide, which is... Whereas um, carbon is only 12. So you just divide... 44 twelfths. Of all the energy used throughout the world, about not something percent comes from fossil fuels. So yeah, it's up, up around the 80, 90 percent mark. Uh, which, which fossil fuel has the least carbon dioxide? You can uh, just go to the table and go, mm, don't know, find it. Um, carbon dioxide, I would have thought it would be. We're talking about the fossil fuels, which are petrol, diesel, oil, natural gas. That's about it. 
So look them up. Okay, when a machine is inefficient, how does the inefficiency... Um, how can you spot something that's inefficient? Um, usually in the form of such or other. Heat. heat. So uh, when, it, when something's giving out a lot of heat um, and it's not supposed to, something's wrong. Or if you're looking for where, where are we wasting energy, well, look for heat losses. And converting energy, we've got a torch here, can g converts from one to the other to the other. So starting off with chemical... Etc. So you can whiz through those ones pretty easy. So uh, it's just no, it's just completely different mechanism. It is more light and less heat. So one, another way to say that is that there is more light of the correct wavelength. So uh, the other ones are giving out a whole lot of infrared radiation, which we can't even see. It's not doing us any good. So like the bathroom lights that that you put to warm you up. So they're, they're designed to give you a lot of low frequency light, which is coming out as heat, compared to an LED, which doesn't give you much of that, gives you more of the frequencies that you're after, higher. Is that like related to the light spectrum? Like yes. Like yep. So general, generally speaking, the heat is in the infrared range. Yeah. And that tend, it, whereas infra means in beyond what we can see. It's below what we can see. Um, so in the, the rainbow that we can see, as you go down, the red's near the bottom, and then you can't see after that. That's infrared. And then above what you can see is violet, that is the top. So above violet is ultraviolet, and that's too high for us to see. Yeah, so the ultraviolet is the one that gives you the sunburn, and the infrared is the one that heats you. That's infrared. They're infrared. Yeah, yeah. That, that won't do much for your suntan. Oh, no, I don't want no, it'll warm you up. Warm it up. should warm you up, yeah. By uh, a couple of milliwatts, <laughs> <laughs> if that. Uh, okay, so um, we've already talked about the um, thing. And here's some examples of, of numbers. How, what's the overall efficiency of the power station if we're going from burn it? You should do this question first and then do the other one. One by 0 0.85 <coughs> Yeah, you just multiply each one of those together. If something's 50% efficient, followed by another thing 50%, you only end up with 25%. It's half of a half of a... So every time you have another process after it, you've got to multiply the efficiency. So it ends up um, not being all that good. It's only about as good as a, a diesel engine. But coal is much cheaper than diesel oil. And uh, another generalised question, how much radiation do you get in uh, Australia um, on a solar, solar panel per square metre? How many watts per square metre? Now, uh, full-blown full blown sunlight in the middle of summer, it's actually quite high. But um, we're talking about the um, average daylight. So it's, you've got to knock it down a bit. Um, have a little Google search. Hopefully the, the um, choices here are wide enough that you're not going to get two of them mixed up. <coughs> And uh, efficiencies of a solar cell. Yeah, they're not they're not as high as uh, often claimed. Like the best solar cells you can get are around about twenty, high twenty percent. Um, but that's in absolutely ideal conditions. But by the time you have a bit of shade, clouds, sunlight, dust on the surface, uh, getting older, and also the cheaper ones aren't anywhere near as efficient as those high, highly uh, high performance ones in labs. So they tend to be only like 10% um, sort of numbers. So uh, probably between 5 and 15% would be kind of the range for a typical solar cell. Is that why some people use them by just like putting one and then using mirrors to reflect on it? Yeah, try and get more light bouncing onto it. If you've got a wall behind it and from the north, that'll, that'll help. I remember there were like this tower or something and they put lots of mirrors around it that are programmed to reflect all the sun. Oh yeah, now that's, that's a different thing when you actually program active mirrors that keep steering. Well, they do that to actually heat it up. They can produce all the sunlight and end up with high temperatures in the tower, like 1,000 degrees. A right, typical power station has an output of about, well, um, typical turbine would be um, about 600 megawatts, so depending how many turbines. But a couple of gigawatts would be a typical power station. Whereas if you compare to a, um, a wind turbine, I just mentioned a power station could do a couple of gigawatts, a wind turbine, this is a really large one, which is um, 126 metres diameter. 
Okay, so that would that would uh, make a seven four seven look small. Seven four seven is only like about as big as the end of that crane. Uh, and that's officially rated at six megawatts. Six megawatts. And one turbine off a power station, they might have four of them, is about six hundred megawatts. So a power station is like a thousand or hundreds of them. So don't you think large is a bit of a general term? Uh, well, this is a large. This is about as big as they they, they can get. These um, wind turbines. It is big, yeah. But it has, it has. Uh, they are bigger than that now. There's apparently there's one, one bigger than this now, but this is certainly bigger than anything in that Australia. Yeah. Well, it's 126 meters diameter, so it's like pretty close to 80, 90 meters tower. There's the tower there next to a person. All right, now to something totally different. Just in case you're feeling hungry. How much um, energy would you get out of a Mars bar? So that's something you can look at. Now, that when you look at food and it has energy labels on it, that's the same thing. So we can also have food energy. In fact, food energy would be considered chemical energy, just like petrol. So you could use your Mars bars and put it in your fireplace and heat up the house with Mars bars. That would work. It would I thought you could like to turn nutrient content of food by burning and seeing how much That's right. That's how they do it. So they, how do they measure the actual energy in these things? They have to heat, they burn the actual chocolate like a piece of fuel and measure how much heat comes out of it. And we can, we'll look at that a bit later on. <coughs> so you'll have, to, you'll have to go and buy a Mars bar to answer this question. Now they're measured in kilojoules. Kilojoules. So yeah, not in joules, kilojoules will be. <clears throat> right, now there's this other word, entropy, we haven't mentioned yet. We're only going to mention it very briefly and then we'll forget about it because that's really something for advanced thermodynamics. Entropy is related to how possible or how usable the energy is. So sometimes there's a whole lot of energy. For example, when, I heat, when the sun comes out and heats up the ocean, the top of the ocean is warm and the bottom of the ocean is cold. Well, that's energy. There's a huge amount of energy in the ocean that's been warmed up by the sun. But we can't really use that energy because it's not hot enough to run an engine. Whereas if, if energy is in the form of very, very hot uh, temperature, like the inside of a combustion engine um, or, or uh, really hot steam, that's very usable. We can easily make a machine to do something with really hot steam. But, so uh, entropy tends to be related to how usable the energy is. <coughs> Converting uh, Celsius to absolute temperature, we need to make sure we understand absolute. Remember, our um, definition of temperature is the vibration of the molecules. <coughs> so, uh, So if we have a bunch of molecules here and there vibrating a lot, then they're at a higher temperature. So eventually, if they're vibrating enough, they break apart and become a liquid. And then as a liquid, if they get more and more vibration, they eventually break apart and become a gas. So <coughs> if we go the other way, if we go cooler and cooler, we have less and less vibration. Eventually, they stop vibrating at minus 273 degrees Celsius and if you try to get any colder than that you can't if we were trying to get any colder than this the only way we can get colder is by taking the vibration out of it having less vibration but it's already stopped so that is the coldest you can get it's called absolute zero and in the we have another temperature scale which is the Kelvin scale and t minus 273 and a bit in Celsius equals zero degrees Kelvin. You, by the way, you don't write degrees in Kelvin, you just write K. So zero Kelvin is just okay. Very cold. You can't get colder than that temperature. Okay. So it's quite simple, just add 273 to Celsius. Uh, yes, right. It uses the same scale graduations as Celsius, so that, um, you just add 273 and you'll be at zero Celsius. What's the temperature of the uh, liquid nitrogen? 
uh, minus 150, I think. So this this is way down there. Like the only thing that would be liquid down there would be um, something like helium. That's the the most liquid one. <coughs> yes, li uh, they haven't frozen helium yet, so they doubt that it can be frozen. It acts really weird. Now, what is the temperature difference between the inside of the oven and the outside of the oven? We both measured in Kelvin. Now, temperature difference in Kelvin is exactly the same as in Celsius, so it doesn't matter because they have the same scale. They're just shifted by 273. So, yeah, that's too easy. Just subtract the two. Um, pressure gauge. Now, we're also talking about pressures. Now, we did this already in fluid mechanics, so this makes it easy. In the textbook that we have, actually does thermo first then fluid so some of this we can whiz through because we already know how to convert don't we from gauge pressure to absolute pressure what's the difference all right absolute we, we add our atmospheric pressure 101.3 to uh, to um, convert from absolute to gauge or gauge to absolute gauge pressure it means the pressure compared to the atmosphere Absolute pressure means the pressure compared to a vacuum. And uh, when we're converting a vacuum, which is at minus 80, that means the vacuum gauge is reading from the atmosphere, and then you start the vacuum pump and it's pumping down. It's taking it out of the tank, not putting it in. So we're going backwards. And they usually set them up to go backwards. So they run anti-clockwise. So we start off pumping here, and then as we pump it down, it goes all the way back, and we've got down to minus 80. So what's the absolute pressure there? Well, it depends on the atmospheric pressure, but it's going to be roughly 20, 21 and a bit oh, pascals. Um, all right, just uh, some general questions here. This is uh, a pressure vessel, but it's a vacuum vessel, so we're, we're taking the air out of it, and the atmosphere is pushing against the window. And if the window um, is um, <coughs> a viewing window, obviously. So what pressure should we take... Um, that's, if we're going to calculate this, well, how much pressure is on that window if we have a vacuum inside? Well, it's going to be the atmospheric pressure. But remember, ap atmospheric pressure, this number, that's, a, that's like a, a bit over the top average number. But if you look at the weather, you'll notice that the air pressure goes up, goes down different days. And so there's a range. So this, this kind of ranges from 90-something from up to you know 104, maybe 96 or so. And this... It ranges all the time. So if you're going to build this thing, what pressure should you be taking? Well, you should be taking more like the highest pressure that you're going to get. And what if you built this thing up on a mountain where the air pressure is low and then somebody took it down to the sea level where the air pressure is higher? So, uh, of course, we'll have safety factors on top of that as well, which would be much bigger. Uh, the highest pressure that you're going to have. Yeah. Now, um, adjust it absolutely... Um, standard sort of question out of fluid mechanics. Since we've already done fluid mechanics, you should breeze through this one, calculating the density and um, the specific volume. And that's it. Finished. By the way, remember specific volume, which is a bit weird. Specific volume equals 1 over density. Well, by the end of this subject, you're going to discover why we actually invented specific volume. It does actually have a purpose apart from being the opposite of the inverse of density. That's it. <laughs> Done.